This is the third in a series of videos correcting various claims made about the Islamic Golden Age. See the first video in this series for the context. This video addresses claims about the preservation and translation of Greek and Roman texts by Muslim scholars during the Middle Ages. It is claimed that Muslim scholars preserved countless Greek and Latin texts by translating them into Arabic, preventing them being lost forever. Senior European correspondent for the scientific journal Nature, Alison Abbott, says, quote, It was to Persian and Indian scholars that the translators turned when they needed to make scientific, as well as linguistic, sense of the old Greek manuscripts, end quote. However, even if these manuscripts had not been translated by the Arabs, they would not have been lost forever, since they were already being preserved largely by Byzantine Christians in the East and partly by Christians in the West. Regardless, Abbott's claim is actually completely backwards. The translators of the Islamic Golden Age to whom Abbott refers did not turn to Persian and Indian scholars when making sense of the old Greek manuscripts, in fact, they did not need to because they were not only literate in Greek, which is why they were chosen as translators, but they were familiar with the Greek philosophical texts they were translating. Reading Abbott's article, a casual reader could be forgiven for concluding that these translators were Muslim scholars, but Abbott does not identify exactly who they are. However, an article by Dr. Rachel Hajar of the Hamad Medical Corporation in Qatar says explicitly, quote, Islamic scholars translated their voluminous writings from Greek into Arabic and then produced new medical knowledge based on those texts, end quote. A much more detailed article on the translation movement of the Islamic Golden Age, written by Dr. Hala al-Khalidi and Dr. Bashmad Ahmed Sedki Dajini of the University of Jordan, provides much more information. This article describes the translators as Syriacs, Arabs, Arabists and Muslims, with one reference to a Nestorian doctor. The article concludes by referring to, quote, the role played by Muslim translators, end quote, explicitly attributing the translation movement of the Islamic Golden Age to Arab Muslims. Many scholarly journals and academic books repeat the same narrative. Professor Bahatin Karagazulo of the King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia says, quote, Muslim translators first translated the Greek knowledge into Arabic and then into other languages, end quote. Cultural anthropologist Dr. Tanya Gulovich says, quote, Muslim translators set about decoding those ancient texts. Dr. Ashhad Islam of the International Islamic University of Malaysia goes so far as to say, quote, it is entirely due to the Muslim translators that the rare books of Hippocrates and Galen were saved from extinction, end quote. Describing the translators of the Islamic Golden Age as Syriacs, Arabs, Arabists, Muslims and Islamic scholars, these articles all give the impression that the translation movement was almost exclusively the work of Arab Muslims. The scholars who attribute the work of the translation movement to Muslim translators are usually Arabs or Muslims, and it is possible that their use of this description is attributable at least in part to an internal bias. However, it should be noted that not every Arab or Muslim scholar uses this description. Nevertheless, regardless of the identity of the writer making the claim, attributing the translation movement to Muslim scholars is extremely misleading and a distortion of the facts. In reality, none of the translators of the Islamic Golden Age were Arab Muslims or Persian Muslims or even Muslims of any other ethnic group. While it is true that Muslim scholars, whether Arab, Persian or otherwise, helped preserve many of the Greek classical texts, they did not do so by translating them. In fact, Muslim scholars could not translate them. The whole reason for the translation of Greek texts into Arabic during the Islamic Golden Age was not for the purpose of preserving them. It was because Muslim scholars could not read Greek or Latin and were therefore totally unable to understand the texts they had acquired unless they were first translated. Franz Rosenthal, who was the Sterling Professor Emeritus of Arabic at Yale University, noted that the famous 9th and 10th century Muslim commentators on the Greek texts did not actually know how to read or write either Greek or Syriac. Peter Adamson, professor of philosophy at the University of Munich, writes, quote, When philosophers like Avicenna and Averroes read Aristotle, it was never in Greek, a language of which they were ignorant, end quote. Since they could not read the Greek texts themselves, 
Muslim scholars paid Christian and Jewish scholars to translate these works into Arabic for them. In contrast to Alison Abbott's claim, it was actually the Christians who could understand not only the language, but the philosophical background of the Greek texts. Adamson comments, quote, These Christians could offer expertise in the relevant language and also the intellectual background needed to understand what was going on in a work like Aristotle's Categories, or On the Soul, end quote. Historian of philosophy Christina Dancona likewise says, quote, Even under the Abbasid rule in the 8th and 9th centuries, the Christians of Syria were the unexcelled masters of Aristotelian logic, end quote. In another work, Peter Adamson writes, quote, When Muslim aristocrats decided to have Greek science and philosophy translated into Arabic, it was to Christians that they turned, end quote. This is the exact opposite of Alison Abbott's claim that the translators turned to Persian and Indian scholars to make sense of the Greek manuscripts. Professor Emeritus of Near Eastern Studies Bernard Lewis likewise wrote that the medieval Muslims found translators, quote, among their Christian or Jewish subjects or among converts from those religions, end quote. Franz Rosenthal commented, quote, almost all translators were Christians of various churches, end quote. This is confirmed by Dr. Mohammed Hanan Hassan, a specialist in Islamic civilization, who writes that out of 44 translators listed by a prominent Arab biographer of the Islamic Golden Age, quote, 28, 64% are Christians, two are Sabaeans, one is a Jew, none are Muslims, and 13, 29.5%, are unknown, end quote. He goes on to say, quote, This study supports Rosenthal's assertion that almost all translators from Greek and Syriac into Arabic were Christians belonging to various churches. End quote. Maria Mavruri, professor of Byzantine history and classics at the University of California, Berkeley, says, quote, It is also well known that the translators of Greek texts into Arabic, either directly from Greek or via Syriac, were, in their overwhelming majority, Christians. Unlike the Muslim scholars for whom they were translating, Christian and Jewish scholars were typically literate not only in their native language, but also in Greek, Latin and Arabic, and sometimes in additional languages such as Hebrew or Syriac. The Christian scholar Hunan ibn Ishaq al-Ibadi was fluent in Greek, Syriac, Persian and Arabic, and was known by his Arab contemporaries as the Sheikh of Translators. As head of the famous House of Wisdom, the great library and education center in Persian Baghdad, it was this Christian scholar who led the translation movement of the Islamic Golden Age. In an article in the English Guardian newspaper in 2008, Professor of Physics Jim Al-Khalili claimed, quote, for over 700 years the international language of science was Arabic, end quote. In fact, historical evidence proves the facts are completely the other way around. Greek and Latin were the international languages of science since they were spoken exclusively by non-native speakers, whereas Arabic was spoken almost exclusively by native, that is, first language speakers. Professor of French Michel Goyens says, quote, The medieval lingua franca of science and religion were Greek and Latin, which by then had become languages without native speakers, end quote. Greek and Latin were the international languages of science for nearly 2,000 years, which is why Greek texts had to be translated into Arabic for the benefit of Muslim scholars. For European scholars, there was no need to read Arabic in order to study science, since there was ready access to European scientific commentary in Greek and Latin. Arabic was used for science only in majority Arab-speaking regions. It was not used as the language of science in Western Europe, which predominantly used Latin, or Eastern Europe, which predominantly used Greek. Arabic was thus not actually international at all. Even by the time that Arabic scholars were producing massive volumes of valuable scientific commentary, European scholars did not have to learn any Arabic. Instead, a small number of European scholars translated Arabic works into Latin. Ironically, by the time these Arabic texts were being translated into Latin, the Islamic Golden Age was already in decline and very little new scientific work was being produced in the Muslim world. Professor David Deming says, quote, In the 11th century AD, Hellenistic studies in the Islamic civilization were on the wane, and by the end of the 12th century AD, they were essentially extinct. End quote. Why is it that the true identity of the translators during the Islamic Golden Age is so widely misrepresented? <laughs> 
The reason is that the facts about the Christian involvement in the development of science and in the translation of Greek texts during the Islamic Golden Age have historically been suppressed, not only by Muslim scholars, but also by secular scholars and even by Christian scholars. This seems counterintuitive and requires some unpacking. Each of these groups suppressed the historical facts at different times with different motivations. The first efforts to obscure the Christian contributions to science and the translation of Greek texts into Arabic were made by the Muslims themselves. As part of their theological struggle with Christianity, many Muslims found it necessary to depict Christians as having lost, neglected or squandered the Greek intellectual heritage, and Christians were even accused of having brought about the death of Greek science, a common trope which endures to this day. Dr. Nadia Maria El Sheikh of the American University of Beirut in Lebanon has written extensively on the subject of the early Muslim strategy of accusing Christians of bringing about the death of Greek science. She says, quote, Muslim authors blamed the death of science and philosophy on the Christianization of the Roman Empire, end quote. El Sheikh records that Muslims commonly attributed the decline of Greek science to the 4th century, subsequent to Christianity's rise under Constantine. Professor Maria Mavrudi, historian at the University of California in Berkeley, notes that during the 9th and 10th centuries, Muslim scholars constructed a narrative that, quote, the sciences died out in Christian Byzantium and were transferred to the Islamic world, end quote. It may seem ironic that this anti-Christian narrative was invented and promoted at the same time that Muslim scholars were studying Greek texts which had been translated for them by Christian scholars. However, it is likely that the Muslims who originated this narrative would have seen it as entirely justifiable from a theological and historical perspective. Theologically, Muslims believed that their religion was the truth and that Christianity was an incomplete divine revelation which had become corrupted and was in need of correction by Allah's new revelation as communicated to Muhammad. Historically, it was a fact that Muslim armies had been extremely successful and that their many conquests had resulted not only in the subjugation of many kingdoms but also in the capture of their immense financial and intellectual wealth including the vast libraries of Greek literature they found in previously Christian regions such as Alexandria in Egypt, Assyria, Hispania and the Iberian Peninsula. On this point, however, it should be noted that it is not true that Muslims gained Greek texts only through conquest. Although this did happen to a large degree, many other classical works were bought directly from Byzantine Christians by Persian rulers, who paid enormous amounts of money for them and brought them into their libraries for the benefit of Muslim scholars. Nevertheless, given the military success of the early Islamic era, it is unsurprising that Muslim scholars felt entirely justified in viewing themselves as having taken over the Greek intellectual tradition from the Christians. Muslim claims that Christianity had caused the death of Greek science served as a rationalization for Muslim appropriation of the Greek literature, an explanation for why they were entitled to dominate the Christians and displace them as the custodians of the Greek heritage. This is demonstrated by the fact that these Muslim anti-Christian polemics are typically placed within an apologetic framework, explicitly arguing that Muslim seizure of the Greek intellectual literature was justified by the failings of the Christians. One argument was that Christians had forfeited their right to the Greek intellectual tradition due to their Christian beliefs. Professor Maria Mavrudi says, quote, Arabic scholars presented themselves as having salvaged the pagan Greek heritage from a people whose conversion to Christianity represented such an ideological and political break from their glorious past that it was leading them to destroy its legacy, end quote. Mavrudi says another argument used by Muslim scholars against the Christians was that, quote, neither they nor the Jews, but only the Muslims possess philosophy, end quote, and that Christians had, quote, falsely appropriated the achievements of the ancient Greeks, end quote. It was further argued that since the Byzantines were Christians and the classical Greeks were pagans, the Byzantines were not the legitimate heirs of the Greek intellectual tradition. Mavrudi explains that such arguments as these were repeated by Muslim scholars for centuries, with the main claim being that Christianity was incompatible with philosophy and that Christianity had consequently destroyed Greek science. Mavrudi notes that these arguments are still occasionally found in modern scholarly literature, citing Dimitri Gutas, professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at Yale University, who claims that, quote, philosophy died a lingering death before Islam appeared, end quote. 
and who attributes its revival to the 9th century Muslim philosopher Yaqub ibn Ishaq al-Kindi. However, this position is only marginal in current scholarship. Christians during the Islamic Golden Age were clearly aware of these claims and obviously took them seriously since they wrote strong responses to oppose the Muslim narrative. Maria Mavudi cites two 9th century Byzantine Christian texts presenting counter-arguments. However, the obscuring of Christian involvement in the development of Greek science and the translation of Greek texts into Arabic was not merely an anti-Christian argument originating from Muslims. In fact, it was repeated by Christians of the Renaissance, who wished to depict themselves as the true revivers of the Greek intellectual heritage and who created the myth of the Dark Ages in order to depict the Christians of the Middle Ages as anti-intellectual and scientifically ignorant. In this view, Greek science was lost after the fall of Rome and was not restored until the Renaissance era. Mavrudi says, quote, We now know that this argument was created by Renaissance humanists who sought to dismiss earlier scholastic Aristotelianism. End quote. Finally, a couple of centuries later, secular scholars repeated the claim of an intellectual dark age during which Christians neglected Greek texts and learning. The 17th century scholar Edward Gibbon was one of the earliest secular historians to make this claim, and his work not only popularised the idea, but gave it such credibility that it was continued well into the 20th century. Gibbon poured scorn on the idea of any scientific progress during the Middle Ages, and ridiculed the medieval scholars of England's most famous universities, saying, quote, The schools of Oxford and Cambridge were founded in a dark age of false and barbarous science. End quote. In the post-Enlightenment era, when secular interests were gaining social acceptance and political power, non-religious and anti-religious figures found this a useful weapon with which to attack their religious opponents and discredit Christianity. Two 19th century writers in the United States, Andrew Dixon White and John William Draper, were responsible for establishing what is known in the history of science as the conflict thesis, arguing not only that science and religion are incompatible, but that Christianity in particular was responsible for both the death of Greek science and the suppression of scientific knowledge and advancement during the centuries between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance. This narrative has long been abandoned by modern historians, though it is still preserved in the occasional academic work. Two recent books attempting to revive this model are The Darkening Age, The Christian Destruction of the Classical World, 2018, by classical scholar Catherine Nixley, and The Closing of the Western Mind, 2007, by historian Charles Freeman. However, both of these works have received only a lukewarm response from mainstream scholarship, which shows no interest in returning to the conflict thesis. Nevertheless, scholarly works on the history of the Islamic Golden Age still have a tendency to obscure the Christian involvement in the work of translating the Greek literature for the benefit of the Muslims who could not read it. This is particularly apparent in works written by Arab and Muslim scholars. In their article on the translation movement of the Islamic Golden Age, doctors Hala al-Khalidi and Bajma Ahmed Sedki Dejani of the University of Jordan say, quote, Arabs borrowed from all known cultures, end quote citing the Arabs borrowing knowledge from the Greeks, Indians, Egyptians, Nabataeans, and Chaldeans. However, they never mention the fact that the Arabs of the Islamic Golden Age relied heavily on Christian translators and scholars, nor do they mention the Jewish scholars who also made significant contributions. Consequently, it is no surprise that Professor of Philosophy Peter Adamson comments, quote, Amongst the understudied fields in mainstream history is the significant role many Christian scholars had in the Islamic Golden Age, end quote. The Islamic Golden Age shouldn't really be a kind of historical battleground over which various special interest groups fight in order to present their members as the most significant, while obscuring the contributions of those outside their group. On the contrary, it should be remembered as an age of extraordinary cooperation between scholars of a wide range of ethnic origins, including Jews, Arabs, Persians, Egyptians, and various Western Europeans, holding a number of different religious views, including Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Zoroastrianism. The Pakistani Muslim YouTube channel Al Muqaddimah has an excellent series on the Islamic Golden Age, which is introduced with great care in the first episode, in which it is described accurately as an era of scholarly collaboration between Muslims and members of other faiths, as well as people of various different ethnic groups. Here are two clips from the first episode. <laughs> 
When we call it the Islamic Golden Age, the idea comes to mind that it was just Muslims, but it really wasn't. For instance, many of the personal physicians to Abbasid caliphs themselves were Christians. A Christian called Hunan ibn Ishaq al-Ibadi was the head of the House of Wisdom for a long period of time. Jews and Zoroastrians played a huge role in translating old works of Greek, Roman, Persian, Chinese and Hindu origin into Arabic. Please watch the entire video and subscribe to his channel. It's an excellent source of detailed, well-researched historical information on the history of Islam. The spirit of cooperation during the Islamic Golden Age was remarkable, especially given the fact that it emerged at a time of international and interfaith conflict. It is also a reminder that science is a universal human enterprise and does not belong exclusively to any particular culture or ethnic group, regardless of which group or culture makes the greatest contribution. This is definitely one of the most important and valuable aspects of the Islamic Golden Age, and is of particular relevance to the modern era.